All right, Dr. Eschelbach, you're on your own. Okay, very good. Let's see if we can get this started here. Okay. All right. Okay, uh, good evening. We're going to talk about respiratory diseases tonight, and as well as uh, talk about some examination uh, tips. So make sure you have your audio on so you can hear um, exactly what we're dealing with. So we'll start out with just the basic anatomy. Um, the basic anatomy of the respiratory system begins all the way up here in the nasal cavity and oral cavity. Uh, they are two separate cavities, but they both combine back into the pharynx, just above the trachea and just above the larynx um, to lead down into the lungs. And uh, the larynx and uh, pharynx kind of serve as protection against uh, aspiration of fluid or uh, the nasal cavity, of course, uh, prevents uh, things from getting in. And then uh, in the trachea itself, uh, this is the uh, area where the uh, uh, bronchi uh, lead into. And we wind up with our uh, crina right here, which is part of the bronchus, our right lung and our left lung. And of course, the diaphragm as we take a deep breath in, our diaphragm descends. And as our diaphragm descends, it pulls air into the lungs and the lungs fill up. Uh, down at the smaller aspects, here is our trachea in the midline, primary bronchus, secondary bronchus, tertiary bronchus. And as we get down here to the meat and potatoes of the respiratory uh, system, the bronchiole and terminal bronchioles lead into the alveoli. And at the, it's here at the alveoli where the gas exchange happens. So as we breathe air in, it goes through a series of bronchi down to the alveoli where our, our alveoli take the oxygen in, exchange CO2 and uh, let go of CO2 and uh, bring the oxygen into the blood system. So the physiology is pretty basic. Uh, we take in oxygen and uh, as we take in the oxygen, we use up the glucose and down in the cell at the cellular level, we get rid of carbon dioxide and water. Uh, in the very, very basic of the alveolus, where I said that the meat and potatoes uh, happens, the air is taken in. You've got the pulmonary arteriole. As you can see, it's shaded blue. It's shaded blue uh, to denote that it's oxygen poor, and it takes in the oxygen and uh, spits out the CO2. So the oxygen comes in, the CO2 goes out, and uh, the pulmonary capillaries then uh, are oxygen rich and pull that um, blood to the rest of the body. Inspiration is an active process. Uh, the chef, chest cavity expands, uh, interthoracic pressure falls, and our diaphragm falls, and the air flows until the pressure equalizes. Expiration is passive where we just let our air out, uh, the chest size decreases, the interthoracic pressure rises, and the airflow uh, leaves until the pressure equalizes again. Um, it's an autonomic function, meaning that we don't think about breathing. Thankfully, we don't have to. Uh, we just do it. Uh, imagine what a pain it would be if we had to sit there and go, okay, breathe. Uh, so, uh, primary drive is increased by an increase in arterial CO2. So as our CO2 in our bloodstream goes up, primary drive tells you to breathe more or faster. 
And the secondary drive is hypoxic drive when there's a decrease in oxygen in the blood. So we've got a primary and a second drive that feeds the autonomic function of breathing. So what is adequate breathing? Uh, a normal rate and depth, regular breathing pattern, uh, good breath sounds on both sides of the lung, equal chest rise and fall, and warm pink and dry skin. This is all part of what we call the primary survey. Um, a, B, C, D, E, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. So to truly monitor whether or not somebody is adequately breathing, we should be observing them, meaning we should open up their shirt or their blouse and actually watch their breathing pattern to make sure they're doing all the things that we're talking about for adequate breathing. Inadequate breathing uh, is either uh, too slow or too fast, uh, less than 12 or greater than 20. Very often um, I'll ask, you know, what are the vital signs and they'll say normal and then they'll give me a breathing rate of 22. I go, well, that's not normal, that's tachypnea, right? So shallow or irregular respirations, unequal chest expansion, which might be a clue to a, a pneumothorax or perhaps a, a blocked lung, uh, decrease or absent lung sounds, again, could be a pneumothorax or a pneumonia. Accessory muscle use, this is very, very um, important when you're looking at pulmonary uh, exam for children, and I'll have a few uh, slides on that. And then pale or cyanotic skin color and cool, clammy skin appearance. So what is obstructive uh, pathology? We think of things like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. What is obstructive pathology? Well, it could begin, uh, begin as far and high as the tongue. Uh, there might be a foreign body obstruction there, very common in children. Um, anaphylaxis or angioedema, where there's swelling in the upper airway. And then facial trauma and inhalation uh, burn injuries are possible. Epiglottitis and croup, which I'll go over in a couple of minutes. And then aspiration of either vomitus or body fluids or water or something to that effect. Restrictive pathology can occur from several different disease entities. And these are things that are restricting in, uh, the air from getting into the lungs, such as asthma. What do we hear when we see that? we see here wheezing. We might hear that in COPD as well and emphysema. And then chronic bronchitis, COPD, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis are kind of all hand-in-hand -hand, uh, diseases of uh, restrictive pathophysiology, almost always in older adults. There can be uh, diffusion pathophysiology, meaning that that's down at the alveoli level. You're having a problem getting the air exchange in the alveoli due to a problem down low. That could be uh, heart failure, toxic inhalations like uh, cyanide or smoke, near drowning, pneumonia, uh, pulmonary embolus happens when there's a blood clot in the arterioles and you can't get good exa uh, exchange of gases because the blood can't move. Uh, this can be from blood clots, amniotic fluid, if a woman had just uh, delivered a child, or a fat embolism can happen if you break a long bone like a femur. Ventilation pathophysiology, that means a problem with air exchange uh, can be trauma, like a rib fracture, uh, pneumothorax or hemothorax, which we've discussed in trauma, diaphragmatic hernia, which is where the lungs are actually compromised by 
the abdominal contents coming up through the diaphragm and decreasing the uh, size of the lungs. Pleural effusion is usually in the form of uh, either a, a congestive heart failure or a tumor or maybe uh, a bad congestive heart failure causing fluid inside the um, lungs. Morbid obesity, people can't take a good deep breath because they're so large. Or neurologic and muscular diseases like polio, myasthenia gravis, uh, muscular dystrophy. These are all things that will prevent you from taking a good deep breath. Control system pathophysiology, uh, meaning that some other system prevents you from that autonomic reflex. Head trauma is common. Uh, if you get uh, hit in the head hard enough, some people will stop breathing. Uh, stroke, you'll have poor respiration due to stroke or uh, depressant drugs. We know that people stop breathing with too much narcotics. That's why Narcan is used as a means of treating uh, narcotic overdose. Uh, sedative hypnotics are also possible, uh, or alcohol in high enough concentration, alcohol can cause a depressed respiratory drive. So where does the obstruction occur? Um, obstruction may result from a head position, meaning that uh, generally the anatomic position is with the head slightly tilted back and the nose exposed. And you can get obstruction from a position of the tongue or aspiration of foreign body. That can happen anywhere above the epiglottis or if something gets below the epiglottis, your epiglottis here is kind of your, oh, shit. your um, guard against uh, foreign bodies or secretions. And be prepared to treat uh, uh, quickly and aggressively in these cases. And you can do a simple uh, head tilt chin lift to open an airway. Uh, if somebody's head is forward, um, it simply blocks uh, breathing that way. Upper airway infections can also interfere with good exchange of gases. Uh, most commonly bronchitis, a common cold, a diphtheria, which we immunize against, pneumonia, a croup in children, or epiglottitis in children or adults, or severe acute respiratory syndrome, which is SIRS, uh, which we'll uh, allude to a little bit later. So here are two um, upper airway infections uh, in a young child, epiglottitis, uh, we thankfully don't see anymore, but here's the problem. Um, Haemophilus influenza is the most common cause of epiglottitis in children, H flu. We're immunized against that. So we don't, we had a great 20 years where we didn't see epiglottitis in children. But for people who refuse to immunize their uh, children because of a misunderstanding of vaccines that believe that uh, vaccines can cause harm, uh, which is probably the furthest from the truth, um, you can wind up with epiglottitis. And uh, we'll talk about that and show you exactly what that looks like. Jane, I, I think your mic is on. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. So signs and symptoms uh, are dyspnea or respiratory distress, um, a seal or barky-like cough, and most commonly when we're going to see that, seal and barking-like cough is not with epiglottitis, but in the wintertime with croup, and I'll show you that exactly. Uh, acute angioedema can happen where the lips and tongue swell. You usually get excessive salivation. And these people like to lean forward uh, because it's better and uh, 
easier for them to uh, breathe that way. And this can lead to strider. And strider is a very distinctive sound, which uh, I will show you in a few minutes. And then they uh, tend to be in the sniffing position uh, by lifting their nose and extending their neck. Uh, they let more air in and they tend to be more comfortable in the sniffing position. All right, this is a, a camera of an epiglottis patient. Now look at that epiglottis, how swollen it is, how large it is. That's why if somebody has epiglottitis, you've kind of got one shot to get them intubated. And we usually do this in the operating room with anesthesia there because you get one touch to that epiglottis and it tends to swell their entire uh, upper airway can swell. And uh, as you do more and more in intubations, you'll know that the epiglottis is kind of a skinny piece of moist cartilage covered by pink tissue. And this is just fat. It's edematous. If you touch that, it's friable. It'll start bleeding. And it's a very severe obstruction can happen because once that obstruction occurs, you've got no way to get the air in. So another uh, obstruction to ventilation and the pathophysiology uh, aspect of ventilation is acute pulmonary edema. This is a buildup of fluid in the lungs. Uh, most historically, it's seen with congestive heart failure. Uh, it can be seen with a form of congestive heart failure from a pump problem. Uh, I had a patient just yesterday in the emergency room with no history of CHF who came in uh, confused and had uh, SATs in the 70s. And when I took a chest X-ray, you could just see all the fluid, the puffiness and fluid aspect of the lungs. Uh, there's a high recurrence rate with pulmonary edema if you have congestive heart failure. And the signs and symptoms are pretty distinct. You're short of breath. Frothy pink sputum, I would say you don't see as much. What happens here is these little pulmonary capillaries right here uh, can get so congested that they break mixing with the saliva here. And then when they cough up uh, sputum, it's frothy and pink. That would be more typical. I don't, you don't see this as much, but you can see it in a drowning victim or somebody who might have flash pulmonary edema, somebody who has an instant, they go from normal to abnormal in a few minutes. You might see that. Uh, you're going to see pedal edema and ascites in these people, meaning they're going to have uh, puffy feet and a, a large belly. You're going to hear rails and wheezes, and very often they'll have hypertension. Uh, your pedal edema looks like this. Uh, a swelling of the ankles and feet. Uh, that's because the heart is not pumping as well. Because the heart can't pump as well, the lungs can't handle the excess of fluid, and you get swelling of, and edema of the feet. You can also get ascites um, in these folks with right heart failure, and uh, they're going to wind up with a large amount of fluid in their belly, um, and their heart is not able to pump that fluid out and exchange that fluid as well. Let's talk a little bit about bronchitis. People uh, come into the emergency room with a complaint of bronchitis very frequently. Um, acute bronchitis is something different than a chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis is a subset of COPD. Acute bronchitis is usually caused by a respiratory virus and it causes inflammation of the bronchi. So if you go all the way back to our anatomy tree, we've got the trachea, we've got the primary bronchi, then we've got the secondary bronchi and tertiary bronchi. When those secondary and tertiary bronchi get inflamed, we wind up with coughing and hacking and it's usually a virus and there's no treatment for it except time antibiotics are not helpful. Chronic bronchitis 
is a condition that's very similar to emphysema, where they have inflammation of those bronchi, and because they're chronically inflamed, it means chronic means old or, or, or uh, frequent, uh, you get poor uh, ventilation and a reduction in ventilation, and you get increased mucus production by the lungs, and that mucus is very difficult to get out. Uh, it usually causes a productive co uh, cough with copious amounts of sputum. Uh, these are what we refer to as our blue bloaters. Uh, there's pink puffers and the blue bloaters of COPD. And the treatment goals are to relieve that hypoxia, so very often we have to give these folks oxygen. These might be the people that you see walking around the grocery store or Walmart uh, pulling their oxygen tank behind them. Um, and reversal of bronchoconstriction. Bronchoconstriction is what we do with acute asthma or COPD. Uh, that's what causes wheezing, which I'll go over in a few minutes. So folks with COPD um, have a chronic bronchitis. Uh, normally the bronchi are unrestricted and they're not inflamed and the mucus is a thin layer of physiologic mucus as opposed to COPD patient where they have increased thick mucus and inflamed structural changes. Uh, emphysema, this happens so, so often and so long that the alveoli no longer efficiently uh, transfer oxygen. Uh, and these are folks we see, um, you'll see them, and it just amazes me that they'll be wearing oxygen to breathe and they'll be smoking a cigarette. Uh, damage to the lungs from repeated infection over time is COPD. Uh, they have a chronic cough, chronic wheezing, and ronchi. Uh, they usually wind up with saturations, 88 to 92, and that's where they live. Uh, they just maintain a low flow of oxygen. Most of us sitting down right now, unless we have lung disease, uh, are probably saturating from 96 to 98 percent. These people are a full 10 percent behind you. Uh, chronically, uh, you can have clubbing over time, and very often these people breathe through pursed lips, meaning they almost like they're going to whistle, and by putting their lips together and breathing in and out, they make their lungs a little bit less stiff, and they're able to, to breathe a little bit easier with pursed lungs or pursed lips. Here's clubbing. Uh, clubbing, it, I don't see as much anymore, um, primarily because most of these folks are on uh, chronic oxygen. So if they get oxygen at night or during the day, you can prevent uh, clubbing, physiologic clubbing, but it's something that is a telltale for COPD or restrictive lung disease that is chronic. You get the very tips where they look like they're bulbous and inflamed. Asthma is different. Very often you'll wind up with a 70 year old who tells you they have asthma and they're probably not asthmatic. They're probably a COPD -er. But true asthma is a common um, but serious disease and it's usually acute bronchial constriction. So on the left here is a normal bronchial. And in asthma, the bronchi becomes inflamed and red and swollen, therefore decreasing the size. So anyone who wants to whistle, they put their lips together, they blow, and you get a sound like that. Wheezing is inspiration of air, and the same thing happens. The inflamed uh, bronchi are smaller, and as air passes, you get a whistling. Wheezing is only that. It's whistling down in the lungs. Uh, the patient tends to look tired. They can be a little blue from cyanosis. Pneumothorax is another condition where you can get uh, a decrease in ventilation. 
where a lung actually collapses. Um, the lung is covered by a thin membrane. And uh, if that thin membrane is uh, damaged, like by a broken rib, or uh, somebody who spontaneously sneezes and increases the interabdominal pressure, you can uh, rupture a bleb or part of the pleura, which is a protective covering to the lung. Once that pleura has been violated, the lung, the lung kind of shrinks down and there's an accumulation of air in the pleural space, squeezing the lung smaller. Signs and symptoms are shortness of breath, uh, chest pain, and you're not going to hear breath sounds over that lung field. And uh, it's pretty, you know, we take, ask people to take a deep breath. We listen to both sides and sometimes you just don't hear this at all. Now in trauma, it's pretty significant. Somebody hit, gets uh, stabbed, somebody breaks a rib against a steering wheel. Um, pneumothorax is pretty uh, definitive. Uh, the treatment is easy. We take uh, a needle and you can uh, place it in the chest in several areas. Uh, second intercostal space, midclavicular line, right about where I'm pointing here. Or now we are instructing our um, paramedics to do it in the fourth or fifth intercostal space laterally, right underneath the fold of the axilla here, uh, because the wall is much thinner in that area. Anaphylaxis can occur causing obstruction. It's characterized by respiratory distress uh, and low blood pressure because you get circulatory collapse. It usually results from the body's response to something, some type of allergen. Um, maybe somebody's allergic to peanuts or shellfish and they ingest it and then they start to swell. And you get airway obstruction due to angioedema uh, and, and that can be a major concern. Pneumonia is a physical infection uh, it's the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, it's usually caused by bacteria or viruses. Uh, very often at this time of year, we'll see influenza, which can cause a secondary pneumonia. Uh, rare instances, you can have a fungal infection uh, causing that. A patient usually is sick in appearance. They usually have a fever. Uh, they can have rigors or shaking with a productive cough. Most commonly with strep, that productive cough is producing a rusty colored or red colored uh, sputum. And there is an increase in sputum. Usually you get increased respiratory rate and effort. Uh, and to keep up with the uh, decrease in perfusion, the heart will go faster uh, by trying to keep up with the lungs by making the heart go faster. Uh, therefore, it keeps pumping faster to get more and more oxygen out of the lungs. You can get wheezes, rails, and consolidated lung sounds where you don't hear very good lung sounds uh, in the left lower lobe or the right lower lobe. That's why you should listen. Um, you know, we all take our stethoscope randomly and put it on people and we listen. And we get so accustomed to listening to breath sounds that it becomes second nature. But when you hear a disease state, when you don't hear those normal sounds, that's what you have to differentiate between normal and a disease state. Pleural effusion can happen from very uh, different things. That's a collection of fluid. Uh, it can be from infection, um, like a tuberculosis infection. It can be from a cancer. Uh, it can be from some type of uh, inflammatory process in the lungs where fluid is produced and the fluid goes into the lung pleura. And you can see as the pleural effusion takes up space that interferes with the exchange of gases. Signs and symptoms of pleural effusion are similar to pneumonia or infection. You get shortness of breath or dyspnea, decreased breath sounds, over the affected area, 
and some people will find positional comfort, maybe lean away because you have some pleurisy or pleuritic pain. Pulmonary embolism is the big killer. Uh, usually what happens in pulmonary embolism, usually, is you get a blood clot in the leg, uh, some one of the femoral veins, for example, or the saphenous veins way down here in the leg, a blood clot can occur. And uh, a clot itself in the leg is not deadly. But when a clot breaks off, it now becomes an emboli. So a clot that's traveling is an embolism. And if it comes up through the inferior vena cava and it's pumped out of the heart, it could be pumped right into the pulmonary arteries and clog the lungs so you get no exchange of gases or of uh, toxic materials. Uh, usually uh, the shortness of breath, you get fast, rapid breathing. Uh, these people can get cyanotic. They usually have saturations below 90%. Uh, there's a chest pain involved. Uh, they can sometimes spit up blood which uh, is not that common, but it can happen. And, or they get hypoxia. They don't have their oxygens drop below 98 or uh, below 90 and in 88 to 85 range. Pulmonary embolism, believe it or not, we're now starting to treat as an outpatient. If the signs and symptoms are good enough that the pulmonary emboli are small, and uh, the hypoxia is not significant. So, you know, it's, it's kind of unfair, but people can have a pulmonary embolism and have an O2 saturation of 96%. Uh, be, but because we're persistent and we can't figure out why they're having chest pain, we keep looking and we might find a, a pulmonary embolism on CAT scan. These people, if they're not hypoxic and they're otherwise healthy, uh, we can send them home by putting them on blood thinners. It can be, um, this is a good uh, examination of uh, a clot in the lungs. Right here you can see, here's the trachea and there's the blood clot in the lungs right here. And you'll see that it leads to this area of lungs here that is dead. Uh, that area of gas exchange uh, is knocked out and it's kind of like a heart attack of the lungs. Um, that's what an embolism is. And uh, you, that area of the lung dies and you just don't get any um, circulation or ventilation at all. Hyperventilation uh, can happen very often. It's over breathing and it results in a decrease in the level of CO2. Hyperventilation syndrome is when we see typically a panic attack or somebody who's breathing so quickly that they're changing the respiratory drive. What happens in the bloodstream? CO2 is a natural buffer of your blood. So you breathe in oxygen, you breathe out CO2. That CO2 inside your body is broken up into sodium bicarbonate, the same stuff you put in your hot tub or baking soda um, that you might uh, use in uh, cooking, uh, sodium bicarbonate and water. And uh, as we breathe in and breathe out, this CO2 kind of buffers our blood. As we breathe too quickly, as we hyperventilate, we blow off all our CO2 and our normal mechanisms of calcium and magnesium moving our muscles becomes affected. And that's why you wind up with tingling of the hands, tingling of the feet, and what we call these carpal pedal spasms. People actually wind up with their hands like this and they can't move them because they're breathing so quickly. Uh, there's a fair amount of anxiety with that they get the sense of death, and, and the, uh, which makes the rapid breathing worse. Uh, they can get di dizziness, and they wind up actually getting 
circumoral numbness and tingling, uh, tingling around their um, lips. And very often people think they're having a stroke because they get numbness. The weird thing about hyperventilation is sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's so shallow and, and um, slight that people don't even know that they're doing it. And before you know it, they're getting into the tingling stages and the numbness and tingling of the lips before they even get to the point where they're breathing in and out quickly. ARDS is Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. It's similar to congestive heart failure or fluid on the lungs, and it's caused by pulmonary edema, uh, a fluid, fluid accumulation in the interstitial spaces of the lungs, and uh, it can cause hypoxia. Uh, it is when the lungs become so damaged. Uh, very often, if somebody's in the ICU for a very long time, they have congestive heart failure, they're flooding with fluids, their kidneys are failing, they can wind up with ARDS where their lungs begin to fail. The underlying etiology includes sepsis or bad infection, pneumonia, uh, somebody who has inhaled a toxic gas or uh, cyanide, for example, or hot flame uh, or hot smoke. Um, emboli can cause this from infection or uh, blood clots in the legs. Tumors can let off uh, factors that can cause uh, clotting of the blood. ARDS is very, very uh, uh, dangerous. It has a 70% mortality. And um, at the BLS level, the best you can do is supportive care. At the ACLS level, we're intubating these people, we're monitoring their fluids, we've got them on a ventilator, and we're trying to always keep them a couple of liters behind on fluid because that fluid all tends to accumulate in their lungs. So let's talk about um, just basic assessment of the patient. Uh, as you come on there, uh, come onto the scene, uh, of course, scene safety you're gonna talk about, but initial assessment, are they sick or they're not sick? Uh, and and um, that's the fun thing about emergency medicine is we get called to an emergency, we can look at somebody in about five seconds, 10 seconds, just get a generalized feeling, man, this person looks really bad, or they're not so bad. So sick or not sick, we do a focused exam, A, B, C, D, E, and then we can do a detailed exam. We come up with an assessment, and then we define a treatment plan. So someone comes in, they're short of breath, we take a look at them, they look cyanotic, they look blue, they're young, they have a history of asthma. We do a focused exam, we hear wheezing, we do a more detailed exam and we hear wheezing in all four lung fields. Our assessment is an acute asthma attack and then we figure out a treatment plan by giving them bronchodilators. Our initial assessment, what's their body position? Uh, what is the color of their skin? Uh, what's their rate and respiratory effort? Uh, are they awake? Are they maintaining? Or are they got a decreased mental status? Uh, what's their pulse? What's the rate? Is it fast? What's the character? Is it bounding? Are they sick or not sick? Do they need oxygen? And identifying the correct course A, B, C, D, E's. Focus, uh, focus exam, uh, most often used by the mnemonic sample. Uh, what are the signs and symptoms? Uh, allergies, you know, do they have a peanut allergy and they just ate a cookie? Uh, what are their medications? You know, if they're on uh, several heart medications, including Lasix, you could be looking at congestive heart failure. Uh, what's their past medical history? That will help you and guide you. Uh, common things happen commonly and rare things happen rarely. So if it's common, Figure that out. When was their last meal or intake? Because we want to know whether or not if we stick a tube in this person, they're going to throw up on us. And what were the events that led to the call? I was fine. I ate a cookie and now I can't breathe. Well, it was probably the cookie. 
focuses exam, OPQRST, the onset, the provocation, the quality, radiation, severity, and time. Uh, we're going to look at their vital signs, uh, look at their skin, the level of consciousness we talked about, what's their respiratory rate, what are their lung sounds, what's their pulse rate and character, what's their blood pressure, uh, make sure we check at both sides, and do they have a good pupillary reaction, are they listening to us, can they hear us. All right, this is where you're going to have to uh, turn up your uh, microphones as I play. All right, crackles or rails are common in congestive heart failure and pneumonia. Right, you could hear that crunchy crackling sound and to distinguish rails from ronchi, uh, ronchi are very common in pneumonia aspiration or COPD. Uh, they have a different sound itself. It's almost a tubular sound. Our next sound is going to be strider. This is the one we're going to find in croup or anaphylaxis, where you've got a narrow, narrow airway, and uh, you might hear it in airway burn. And um, strider is going to be noisy, sonorous is the word. You can almost see that obstruction by listening to that sound. I'll play it one more time. So if you have a young child who's unimmunized, looks sick, is leaning forward and drooling, strider. This is the kid you want to get to the ER right away. Wheezing is a, a musical sound or, a, you know, a, a whistling sound that I did for you before. It's very, very common in asthma or congestive heart failure or COPD. that musical wheeze at the very end is another one so it's a little quicker and then not as musical these are all online if you really want to look go to YouTube type in wheezing breath sounds, and there's some really great tutorials there. If you have 20 minutes that you want to spare, go ahead and do that. We're still working on our focus exam. Based on your clinical findings, uh, when, what you're observing in the patient, and what you see as far as critical signs like jugular venous dissension, tracheal deviation, or paradoxical chest movement, you're going to find up and you're going to uh, quickly Determine what is in your differential diagnosis, what can cause these different types of signs and symptoms, and then act on that accordingly. So here's a little audiovisual review of uh, some respiratory ailments in uh, various children. During breathing, the air inhaled through the nose and mouth enters the respiratory passages. Then, the air entering the respiratory system passes through the trachea, then splits into the bronchi, bronchioles, 
and finally enters tiny sacs called alveoli, where the exchange of gases takes place. Asthma is a disorder of obstruction to breathing due to inflammation and narrowing of the bronchial tubes. Initially, the bronchial tubes become inflamed and produce thick mucus. Later, the muscle surrounding these airways tightens and air cannot move freely. This is called bronchospasm. The result is shortness of breath and the air moving through the tightened airways causes a whistling sound known as wheezing. Pollen, pet dander, weather changes, tobacco smoke, etc. can trigger and worsen asthma symptoms in susceptible patients. Short-acting bronchodilator drugs, which can be inhaled, provide immediate dilation of the constricted bronchi. All right, so that's a treatment plan. All right, so in children, we talked about A, B, C, D, E, E is the expose. We're going to do this in adults and children. Uh, very often, uh, not very often, but sometimes I'll see a, a patient brought in, maybe they're homeless or maybe they're old and they're wearing, you know, a hoodie and a sweater and uh, four t-shirts in the middle of winter and they'll be brought in that way and I'll look at the paramedic and go, how did you come up with an exam when the patient is, you know, looks like uh, the Michelin uh, tire man? Uh, you've got to take those clothes off. I know some of these people you don't want to. Uh, some folks are old and they don't want to part with their clothes. You just tell them we're going to, we got to take a good listen to you. You're going to open up their shirt. Um, you know, older ladies uh, might be modest. You don't have to take their undergarments off. You want to see what's going on with their chest muscles. This next picture is uh, asthma and uh, you get retractions. See the kids using their belly to breathe. They're using their belly to breathe. They're, um, I'm gonna go forward and back so you can see that again. Their chest is pulling in. This you can see in a respiratory syncytial virus or something like a bronchiolitis in the middle of the winter. Uh, you're going to see kids who have this, and it's obvious that they're struggling to breathe. Croup is also a virus, very, very common, and it winds up scaring the hell out of parents. Uh, a kid will start to bark or cough, and they'll wind up with such a strider-sounding cough, it sounds as if they're not going to take their next breath. Seasoned parents will slowly put a jacket on these kids, bring them into the hot shower, and the steam will help work on it, or they'll bring them outside to the cool air. Unexperienced pa uh, parents will panic, uh, throw the kid into the car in the middle of the winter where it's cold, and usually by the time they get to us, the cold air has broken the croup. But here's a croup. So you can't miss that distinctive bark. You'll hear that bark, it's called a seal bark. Uh, and it's very, very distinctive. So if you listen to this again, close your eyes and listen, you'll hear a few things. You'll hear noisy respirations, number one. Then you'll hear this barking like seal cough. And in between, as a child breathes in, because of the inflammation, you'll hear strider. So listen again.
So that child sounds like he's not going to take his next breath. Mom and dad put him in the car seat, cold air, drive him to the hospital, and usually the cold air itself will break that spasm. The treatment for this, believe it or not, is not antibiotics. It's simply anti-inflammatories. We put these people on steroids, these kids on steroids, and they're usually better in a day or two. All right, Strider is a little bit different. Uh, Strider, we're gonna hear, we heard Strider as sounds in that croup patient, but plain old Strider, you'll see this kid looks pretty sick. Uh, he's probably leaning forward. This is probably a kid who's got epiglottitis. So look at him now. He's in the sniffing position. By lifting his chin, he's putting his nares up, increasing the straightness of his neck to decrease the resistance from his nose to his lungs. Uh, in Strider, if it's epiglottitis in this kid, usually uh, the epiglottis, like I showed you in that picture, is swollen and edematous and will make the sound that is distinctive of Strider. Retractions, that's part of the E, exposure. Um, when you see retractions, it means that uh, some kids are tiring so much that they have to use their accessory muscles and those accessory muscles contract and will help get oxygen into the lungs. So if you look up in here, right up in here, that's where the tractions are coming. The uh, inner thoracic muscles are pulling and tightening. So we've done a detailed examination that's complete and thorough head to neck examination um, in non-critical patients. We might skip parts of that uh, because if they're critical, we're gonna get right to our treatment plan uh, try and get as much intervention as possible and key on those critical signs and symptoms that we've talked about. Assessment, what's your best guess? What do you think is happening? Based upon your subjective and objective findings uh, and what you know about a patient's history, develop and implement a plan. What do you do? You're all medics, right? ABCs, airway breathing, circulation, monitor their vital signs, uh, put the patient in uh, comfort. Uh, we all talk about COPD and giving them oxygen and can we give them so much oxygen that we're gonna turn off the respiratory drive? Don't worry about it. It's not gonna happen in the short time you're taking care of that patient. If somebody looks like they need oxygen, give them oxygen. Assist them with their medications if they have nitroglycerin around or something like that, and you think it's congestive heart failure, go ahead and treat them. Uh, maintain their body temperature. Uh, be calm and reassuring. Minimize movement if they uh, have upper airway obstruction uh, so that we don't make things worse and transport these patients rapidly. Uh, the golden rules, if you're thinking about giving oxygen, give it. If they need it, you probably won't hurt them. Uh, if you can't tell whether a patient is breathing adequately, they probably aren't. So do things to increase that. Bag valve mask, position, jaw lift, all these things, chin lift, jaw thrust. If you're thinking about assisting a patient's breathing, you probably should be. So if they need BiPAP uh, to help them, the guy I had yesterday, uh, who had acute congestive heart failure, uh, his blood pressure was so low, I couldn't do things I normally do. I couldn't give him Lasix. I couldn't give him diuretics because if I dropped his blood pressure, he'd be out of it. 
but he was crashing in front of me. I could have intubated him, but I got him by by putting BiPAP on him, assisted positive pressure ventilation. Uh, when a patient quits fighting, it doesn't mean that they're getting better. It probably means they're one step from death. So be careful. Uh, these are your tools of your trade. All right, basic oxygen, bag valve mask, nasal cannula, listening, and that's the basics. And there we go. So I'll entertain any questions. You can unmute your mics if you have questions. Yeah, my name is Zach Miller and I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Is croup also known as whooping cough? Um, no, whooping cough is pertussis. Okay. Uh, croup is a very, very common wintertime and fall time infection. Uh, usually caused by uh, a respiratory virus in kids. Uh, pertussis is whooping cough. It's a very distinct whoop at the end of a cough. Whoop. <clears throat> we don't see it as much anymore because we give children very early on a DPT shot, diphtheria pertussis tetanus. Uh, if you are in healthcare, uh, you have to believe in immunization. We have, there are deadly diseases that we no longer see. And when we see these odd things like pertussis, uh, you know, last time I saw whooping cough, uh, it was actually in um, a firefighter who was uh, not up to snuff on all his immunizations and he wound up spreading it to uh, his mates inside the, uh, uh, the dormitory because he was coughing so much. Most of us are immune to it because we've been immunized, but over time um, we can develop an infection. All right. Ashley Donald, any questions? No, sir, I don't believe so. Thank okay. you. All right. Daniel, you still here? I'm still here. Um, I appreciate it. That was very important, informative, but I don't have any questions that come to mind right away. What I would recommend for all of you is to go on YouTube, excellent videos, type in something you're not quite sure of, uh, and you'll find it on there. All right. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Dr. Eschelbach. And I hope you all have a very lovely holiday season. And uh, if for those of you, uh, Daniel, Ashley, uh, since you have to have some more of these, uh, Dr. Frame is doing the last one of the year for MD Roundtable Friday evening uh, this week at the same time, if you want to make that. When I'm being there. Thank you. All righty. Good night, all. Good night, Good night. Dr. Eschelbach. Good night, Jane. Take care. Good luck. Do well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.